Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Club Metaverse podcast. And I am joined once again by the great Nolan Bushnell. And whereas last time when we spoke to Nolan, we went deep into his past, um, you know, his his incredible sort of legendary career. Today, we're going to focus more on the present and what he's got going for the future in his partnership with Dr. Leah Haynes and the ExoDexa um, education platform, which I'm very actually very interested uh, to hear about because not only is it a book that you can go and find on, on Amazon, Shaping the Future of Education, uh, Dr. Uh, Nolan, Do <laughs> I keep calling you Dr. Nolan Bushnell. It's Nolan Bushnell and Dr. Leah Haynes. Um, but yeah. it's also, um, I think, uh, has the potential to become kind of like a platform for reshifting the education paradigm through games, which is something that I'm very passionate about. And I've actually spoken throughout the years many, many different times um, about this very topic. I've been involved in projects about this very topic. And it's kind of considered to be a little bit of a holy grail of experiential interactive learning is the idea, can you create interactive software or gaming type paradigms that specifically teach things? And the one that everybody always talks about is algebra specifically, mm -hmm. right? Because algebra, not to ramble on too long, is, is the most definitive point where you see a student's trajectory go up or go down. If, if yeah. a student if a student can get past that algebra phase, it's pretty much sad to say, and I can't believe I'm saying it out loud, it tends to go downhill from there. It's a very sort of important crossroad um, in the education of a young mind. But anyway, I'd love to know how did this all kind of come about? What's a little bit of the background of all of this stuff? Well, I've been... Uh... I'm a father of eight, and so I've always felt it was my responsibility to teach my kids. And I discovered that my kids actually learned a lot through the games they were playing. Hmm. You know, Civilization, uh, uh, you know, the um, Where in the World is San Carmen San Diego, things like that, where they were playing them for fun. Sure. But then they did that. I mean, one time my son Wyatt was banned from talking about the step nomads uh, at dinner because <laughs> everybody was tired of it. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so then I started doing some research and, and I s simply asked the question, how do we learn and how do we learn effectively? And it came clear that uh, we remember maybe 5% of what we see, 10% of what we hear, but almost all of what we do. And so doing is the Holy Grail. Lee, do you want to pipe in on that one? Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's keep it open. Um, unless you guys prefer me to sort of navigate. I just, yeah, I'm just kind of, I'm interested in the, in the sort of the birth of all of this. Well, when, um, so I've been working in education for a, a little over a decade, but I have, two children. And as a single mom, two is almost like half of eight. So, uh, but we, when Nolan and I first had a conversation about education, it was sitting at the bar at his oldest son's venue, Two Bit Circus in, in downtown LA. Mm. And, and we were talking about students who are struggling in school. And Nolan made the, the statement that if you take a kid who's been diagnosed with attention deficit disorder and put them in front of their favorite video game, you'll see how well they can focus. And it was really confirmation for me. I mean, there are kids who do need medication and who, you know, I don't want to um, discount all of it. But mm -hmm. I think a significant portion, maybe even a majority of the kids, it's not that they have an issue or a, a, a something that needs medication. They're not engaged. They're not going to school because they're excited to get back to what they're working on. They're going to school because that's what they have to do every day. That's what mm -hmm. they're told they have to do every day. And they do have to go to school. So finding a way, like that's what for me started the whole thinking about how, how do we do this? And, you know, Nolan's the godfather of video games. I was the parent telling my son to get off your video games and do your homework. Now I wish I had told him to keep on going with those video games. Mm. There are careers involved in video games that are fabulous, but also 
there's new research that shows that kids who play video games on a regular basis have more rigor. You know, you fail in the game and you get back up and you get try to get to the next level. You're on a mission to get there. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and their um, their cognitive uh, abilities, their uh, creative thinking, critical thinking, all those skills are increased by playing video games. So taking that into account, and then Nolan's history, and and uh, we have an amazing executive producer who's creating the game with us, and I'm mm -hmm. I'm very excited about it. So is this a is this? I'm sorry. Go ahead, Nolan. You. You were gonna... I was just going to say, and, and you know, Leah, I had a uh, I had a rough draft of a book, and uh, it and I realized, you know, a book that's full of opinions is not nearly as good as a book that has some rigor to it. And so I asked Leah if she would take a look at my book and critique it, hmm. and and she jumped in with both feet and. Uh, became a co-author and uh and i think uh i think made the book actually readable which is another <laughs> benefit <laughs> Thank you. and is is the book following um one specific game or is it a philosophy for creating many different games it, it, is there an actual game associated with the book that serves a like a specific curriculum per se it's sort of a yes no and yes to what you just asked okay <laughs> nolan you go ahead well i was gonna say i perceive it to be more of a blueprint of if i were well i read a lot of science fiction just because that's something i like and my belief is that uh if you read science fiction you get used to the idea of what the world could be. And so in some ways, the book is a blueprint of what I believe and what Leah believes that the, that the world of education can be. Mm. And it's a bit of a manifesto. It's a little bit of a call to arms. It's a little bit of a, you know, I think that there have been several TED Talks and, and things that have pointed out problems in education. Mm -hmm. And I had a rule at my companies is that you couldn't point out a problem until you had a solution. Mm. That that we anybody can any idiot can say see a problem. The the, the idiot that comes up with the solution is what's valued and so i took the attitude that the book should be about probable ways of fixing things you know and when i say probable i don't pretend that i'm an all knowing all seeing all dancing guru guru i i feel like it's a approach and some of the things will be wrong Mm -hmm. But I think most of them are going to be right, and uh, and through uh, testing and rigorous analysis of the scientific method, I think we're going to fix things. And, and what's what's you know, without giving away too much, because I do want people to go read the book and and sort of you know dive into it much deeper. But what what's kind of like the ten poles of the philosophy of how to create that kind of experiential learning, or your your spin on that? It's really about the Socratic method, mm -hmm. that doing, answering questions, being engaged is the secret. And that a lecture is passive. Reading a book is passive. Um, listening to a podcast is passive. Mm. But when you have to answer a question, that forces your brain to engage in a definitive way. And, you know, it turns out that uh, primitive man, when he was being chased through the jungle by a wild beast, 
he was interacting with that beast and he remembered where not to go the mm -hmm. next time. You know, it's it's the way our brains are created. And so I think that the more we can create synthetic life experiences through games, that we can engage the player, we can we can, you know, climb into the brain and make the person remember and uh, increase efficacy. And it seems to me like, you know, first of all, I've heard from multiple investors throughout my career because I, you know, my, my day job is I, you know, I'm the CEO of a virtual reality platform called RiffXR and, and, you know, it's, it's my passion. It's what I work on all the time. So I've been around the gaming industry for a very long time. I, you know, I was the creative director at Atari the, way after Nolan's time, of course, you know, um, but, you know, so I've been around gaming pretty much my entire life. And this has been a holy grail of big time investors that I've heard speak about this over and over and over again. Why, why do you think, you know, there hasn't really been a successful educational gaming product and maybe there is and i'm being ignorant it, it, and it just hasn't reached my you know level of sort of you know understanding but back in the old days when you first got your apple 2e and you went to the first computer classes the application was a learning application right it was like they would you know like it was like a math game and it would teach you know like 14 plus 6 and then if you got the right answer, like a little puppy would run across the screen or whatnot. But, right, I remember that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This was like the Apple IIe. It was like the base application when you started the thing up. Um, why why hasn't there been a bigger silo, you think, or a bigger market for these types of applications? Can I, can I address that first? I, because sure. Just before the pandemic, I went to the to DC to see the uh, expo that the Department of Education does every year for the games they supported the year before. Mm. And there were a lot of lovely games there, but they're all made by academics who are well-meaning, but not gamers. Mm. And then you take the gaming companies that have created games like Minecraft, even, you know, the, sure. the school here that <clears throat> in Los Angeles that they use as one of their test schools just they used it for a couple of weeks and then dropped it. No, because they didn't work with any academics to make sure that the standards were addressed and the things that the teachers have to deal with were in there. So I think that, you know, what we've created, I'm working with the godfather of video games. I am mm. not a brilliant gamer. I am an academic. So I think like, and, and we have a team, like we have a a young man who has both an MBA and a teaching credentials and has been teaching physics at a university or a community college and uh, a team that's doing the academics along with a team that's doing the gaming. And I think that that's what's been missed till now. I think there've been a lot of really value, valiant uh, attempts to enter the, the uh, industry, but, and, and, you know, our, our attempt is, let's follow what the teachers have to do and offer something that gets the kids so engaged that they do want to come back the next day because they're working on something they're excited about. And do you think like <laughs> kind of taking some of the high points of, of sort of gaming genres, right? Like the most basic kind of questions you ask when you're talking about a game, for example, is it single player or is it multiplayer? do you know um is it a single player game or a multiplayer game do you think in your research in your work there's been greater successes found in the single player experience versus the multiplayer experience the best things that i've seen have been basically primarily single player games and then there's simple but i I want to address the previous question a little bit. Sure, sure. Yeah, I apologize. There, in any industry, there's the macroeconomics, and then there's what I'd call the innate friction mm. in that marketplace. Whenever, I mean, so virtually every Western country um, spends between six and seven percent of GDP 
on education for their populace. So that's a big chunk of money. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, that's public, private, you know, government budgets, what have you. That being said, it's surrounded by bureaucracy. And bureaucracy is very, very, very expensive to penetrate because it's risk adverse. That means it really is hostile to the future because the future has not been proven. It is really, really prevalent to graft, greed, corruption, bribery, <laughs> you know, and all of those things tend to mitigate the potential success for small companies, hmm. you know, so that you, you look at a, uh, a company like Pearson for textbooks, the amount of money that they have to spend to get their textbooks adopted in a school district is phenomenal. And so what it does, it shifts the playground from competency to brute force. You know, is the textbook creator that has the best textbook or the one that has the most money to bribe or right. sky boxes to the Super Bowl? <laughs> bribing in another another form. I mean, right. The distribution is, um, you know, is the key. Uh, as I've seen, even with my own products, right? Like the chain of distribution, whether or not you land that government contract that puts your textbook in the school system, versus, a, you know, not landing that contract. You know, you know, the, those those things are, are are massive. One, one, one thing that I've experienced in my own product that I don't know if it ends lends it anything to the conversation is, you know, my game is extremely complicated and I don't have a tutorial in the game because I, I, I can't stand tutorials. And it's the number one bit of feedback that I get from players is there should be a tutorial in the game. And like, they're not wrong, but for me, the dopamine hit that I get when I'm in the game, because my game is a social game, so massively multiplayer, you have tons of people around. When I see one player teaching another player how to do something, not only is it 10 times better that I could have created some, some weird method to kind of instruct you on it, but now it has the added advantage that these two people have a relationship to each other as sort of master apprentice or friends or collaborators. There's something about that teach, you know, teach someone to fish, you know, feed them for a lifetime type thing that I think is very important in, in education as a whole. You're 200% correct. <laughs> I mean, that, that uh, I think you really summed it up in a brilliant way. That was one of the advantages that the arcade world had. Mm. Where That's a great point. Over, I just got killed on that. That's a great point. You know, over the short ob observation, and, you know, we did some tests, and we found out sometimes that if you put a game in to a bar, it would earn X. If you put two games into a bar, same game it would earn the two of them together would earn more than two two X. Mm, wow. And it was, it was because what would happen is that the over shoulder observation of one play, one person playing a game would incentivize the other game to be played. It was a very interesting. I mean, we did all kinds of, game playing social experiences and uh and, and many times we were very surprised you know i gotta tell you one that was a massive fail yeah please <laughs> we had a game called tank okay i and, remember the game 
and it was a coin op game, very successful. And we thought, well, how can we make it more successful? And it turned out that there were these situations where you could put your, you could go into harm's way and get hit, but then be in a position where you could strike back and get better. And we thought, you know, that's not real. Getting yourself hit in a real tank and you're kind of out of the game. So we thought, why don't we do the, do the following? We're going to put electrodes in the, <laughs> in the handles. And if you got hit, we're going to shock you. <laughs> you know, and you, you know, you can shock people pretty, you know, pretty not, easily. <laughs> pain, but, but, but no harm. Um, <laughs> then, we, then we said, well, you know, maybe, maybe, uh, some people won't want to do it. So we're going to have a knob so that you could select how much pain you want to receive. <laughs> a whole bunch, of little, you know, on the game. So we put, we had this all rigged up. We put it, put, I think we built two of them and we put them in two different bars. And lo and behold, the game earned nothing. Mm. And when we when we came down to it, we we discovered that the players had to face their fears. And rather than saying, ha, I'm gonna really get this put put it in for your shock, because whatever you dialed in for you would be you know dialed in for your opponent. And so they decided they didn't want to they didn't want to do that because it really hurt. And then dialing it down, oh, we have to face our wimpiness. <laughs> right, right, right. And so either of them was a good marketing program. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, I, I just Oh, no, no, no. Uh, it, it's super relevant. Um, I think especially to where the frontiers of games are now. In my game, I spent so much time, which I kind of regret, but I'm, I'm actually glad I have the feature that our game supports locomotion via a treadmill, right? It's a VR game, so you can get into a treadmill and you can walk on the treadmill and play the game. Um, yeah. And you can also, it also supports a uh, haptic vest, right? So you can potentially get electrocuted, similar to what you're saying. Nobody uses the haptic vest for the electrocution. And there's one player that we have, because, you know, we're not the biggest game, so we pretty much know everybody. There's one player that we have that uses the treadmill, but the poor uh, guy, when you're playing the game, all you hear is gong, 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 because it's just him <laughs> running on this treadmill as fast as he can. Um, and I must say in my game, in my office, in the game that you can visit, um, I have a, a, uh, um, the, the, um, the, the, uh, the, um, oh God, I can't believe I'm blanking on the name of it. it it's, uh, the computer space. Is it a computer space? The, the, your, your arcade. I just have like a model of the actual, um, arcade of the very first arcade put into that beautiful oh, yeah. kind of, uh, you know, uh, 2001 looking yellow weird thing, uh, which is absolutely right. gorgeous, but uh, computer space, right? What, what, I'm sorry. Right. It, that's what it's called, right? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. So, I modeled that out of gray plasticine on my <laughs> kitchen table. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have one cool. sitting in my thing. I haven't I'll be honest with you. I've looked for it, but I haven't found a ROM of the game itself or else I would put it in because my game supports, uh, you know, um, multiplayer ROMs and stuff. But um, in any case, you know, that's a little bit of a tangent you know, to have when you talk to the Godfather. Space, but Computer space was not a von Neumann computer. It was mm. no software. Well, it was no Zero. software. It was a state machine. Right, right. There has to be an emulation of it somewhere. I just haven't found it. 
there's probably an emulation, but it'd have to be written from scratch because right. Remember, Atari started before the microprocessor had been invented. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Pong was 1972, Computer Space was 1971, and the, the microprocessor, 4004, wasn't until 74. Yeah, it's amazing. And the microprocessor that was good enough was not available until 76, 77. Yeah, you know, no, it's 8080, 6502. And um, anyway, we yeah, diverge. <laughs> no, okay, just what one thing because I because I, I definitely am very interested about this topic is what what is the target sort of age range that's your sort of sweet spot that you guys are developing this this exodexa method for? So initially it will be uh like eighth, ninth grade. And okay. but ultimately we will build out in both directions until we cover K through 12. Okay, and so so initially it is the eighth through ninth, and is it focused on the arithmetic side or is it focused more on the English side or is it both? It's both and science. And okay. we'll add the other curriculum as we go along as well. We're using the International Baccalaureate as our guide mm. for, for uh, uh, standards, but... Um, so it is this algebra thing once again, right? Kind of rearing its head. Well, and the nice thing in a game is you get to, you know, I don't know what level it'll be, but let's say at this point we get them to level six in the game. We know they're algebra ready. We right. know they have all the basis in place and they're ready to start that. So is it, is it geometry to calculus or is it kind of really focused on like algebra A through Z type of thing? Ideally. Well, yeah, we're not there yet, but okay. we'll start with very basic math issues and we'll know so the adaptive learning uh program that we're using is uh you know it'll it'll guide the kids when they end up in an area where they're kind of stuck ultimately when the the software will be able to notify the adult whether it's the teacher or the parent that your child is struggling with this area so the and you know in a perfect world the parent doesn't go over and say oh i see you're struggling in this area how about you try this this and this they go over and say, hey, how's it going? And they get the child to talk about it. And they help the child ask better questions to get them mm -hmm. to the answer. But they <laughs> the math will, you know, it'll it'll be gradient uh, as, as students start. It'll get them to the, uh, when we know that. Then on the English side, is it about sentence structure? Is it about writing? Is it about reading comprehension? What what's What's kind of the focus that you're looking for on that side of the brain? Yeah, all of the above, really. So mm -hmm. they're they're they'll when they arrive, so they're they're arriving on a planet, mm -hmm. and they're being met by a, an algorithm that mm -hmm. they it's called Ape. So the algorithm walks them through the first thing they have to do is build a shelter. Well, you have a, you have math in that, I mean, you have English because they'll be filling in the blanks too. Like the the script the uh, scroll is missing some words like little technical difficulties for them so you have to fill in the words to get to the next challenge so the next challenge will be building your shelter and so that's the uh the gotcha first. and then on the science side is it specifically trying to teach the sort of scientific method of how to create a hypothesis and test it or is it more on the side of trying to learn some basics about science like Hydrogen is the, you know, is the first element and the sun, you know, created helium. And is it that, is it more like knowledge-based science? It's more of what you're talking about. I think, I think, I think what you're talking about is, is, is close to the reality. It's sort of the, the building blocks, Matt. I think that the philosophy of the scientific method, while you could talk to it, as being pivotal it's an abstraction mm. that sometimes um is left best left to being a little bit later on whereas what you can see do feel touch you know biology and a microscope that's cool because you can see all kinds of sure <laughs> you know sure. butterfly's wing is really 
interesting when you look at it through a microscope. You know, protozoa, you know, uh, amoebas, you know, all that stuff is the exploration of life, the exploration of physics. I mean, physics is really cool. Oh, it's Magnetism, electricity, right. you know, mechanical advantage, optics, you know. Why is that candle upside down when it goes through a convex lens? That's interesting. Mm. You know, what's what's a camera obscura? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah. That so it, it, is the platform that we're dealing with. Is it a um, is it a, a is there a VR component to it? Just out of curiosity, or is it just like console PC? Do you guys have distribution in mind in terms browser of where based it's, good. Bra it's browser based specifically, which is probably like the, the widest uh, form of distribution you can get, right? You know, there's, there's an interesting conundrum. Uh, like we, um, we met a guy, I forget his name, Leah, the, the guy who has the VR. The science know, program. The science program using VR. He's got like 20 or 30 really good VR educational things. Mm. And and I'm and we're actually doing some conversation about not just providing our game, but being a bit of a platform to help some of these really good things that we've found monetize. You know, because mm. you know, I I feel like there's some good stuff up there that needs some help. Mm. And, you know, I don't know if we could be a help, but a lot of times you can cloak yourself in the in expertise and you get credit for the other stuff, people's good work, which is, you know, you give them all the credit and everything, but if we're the go-to place for good software content, I think that's just, that's good in this holy path we're on. It gives and, us we, we get the warm fuzzy feelings from them, and and I'm a big believer in uh, in VR in the classroom. I think that you know, if we could put the kids in the middle of the debate with the founding fathers and have them experience the development of the Constitution, it would give them a relationship with it. If we can, you know, put them into the discussions around kitchen tables when the civil war was, you know, starting to percolate. And those are experiences that kids will remember for, and I know we all read the books, but years later, there are only a few books that still kind of come to mind. And even those, I'm not sure we can remember specifics about the way, you know, the story was told, but put them or, in VR. So. Being in VR, the battle of Appomattox and, <laughs> or, or Gettysburg, you know, yeah. before and stand there when Lincoln gave the Gettysburg Address. Yeah, sure. part of the things. Wouldn't that be fun? I mean, <laughs> this will this will sound funny, but every once in a while, I have these little pick me ups that I do every occasionally. I'm feeling blue, which is very seldom. It's well, you're a lucky man. Yeah, <laughs> and but. When I am feeling a little blue, one of the things that always perks me up is in YouTube, there are several instances of the St. Christmas Day speech from Henry V. Mm -hmm. And there's just something about that speech where they're talking about unfathomable odds against them. And yet, buck up. Thus, brands of brothers, those who were not here to shed their blood with me, shall think themselves accursed that sure. they were not. You know. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm sorry. That it's oh no, no, no! It's very relevant because the most creative person that I've had the pleasure of working with was many, many years ago. I was one of the sort of early employees of Rockstar Games. That eventually, be you know, did Grand Theft Auto and all that kind of stuff. Right. And the the president of Rockstar Games, the you know, the Nolan, as you were of of, of, of if you were a, a, of Rockstar, was a, a gentleman named Sam Hauser. 
who's one of the most brilliant people I've ever met in my life. And he used to always, yeah, he used to always tell me, Mark, you know what my, one of my dream games is. And I was like, what? And he was like, I want to make Macbeth into a video game. And, and I, I guarantee you that if somebody plays my version of Macbeth, they'll be able to debate any college academic professor on the ins and outs of what Macbeth is really about, as opposed to just reading it in a classroom and hearing lectures on it. To experience the actual you know, struggle of Macbeth being uh, manipulated uh, by his wife to do X, Y, and Z, right. and what it meant to the kingdom. And, and he was obsessed with this notion that you could take a complex piece of literature like Macbeth and create an experiential narrative around it and actually learn more about the substance of it versus the book um, or versus the, you know, the manuscript. Um, Mm -hmm. And and, and it's an idea that I've, you know, I've always had in my head. Yeah. Yeah. Well, funny you should mention it, but I just two weeks ago, Every once in a while, I, I need a taming of the shrew fix. <laughs> and, and the Richard Burton, Elizabeth Taylor version of taming of the shrew is just genius on every level. Oh, my God. Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, I believe, is one of the greatest achievements in acting, period. Same, same, same duo. Yeah. Right. Oh, and then DiCaprio as Romeo was a good one, too. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, yeah, that's that's good stuff. But, you know, like, there's people that get really into the Shakespeare, and I'm not even sure they still teach Shakespeare in school. But when I was in uh, sort of junior high and high school, obviously the Shakespeare thing is a big part of the curriculum. And there's a big barrier to enter there with the language, right? The language and the iambic pentameter. It, it, it's, you know, you got to really be into it. Right. And now I, I appreciate it now a lot more than I did back then. Back then, Me I was too. like, oh, you know, back then I was like, oh my God, I got to do Henry V, like straight to Cliff Notes. Right. <laughs> so, so, so that's the reality well, of it. But after I left, well, like, Henry V on any time is, you know, except for the St. Christmas Day speech, I kind of think Henry V is a little bit forgettable. <laughs> <laughs> right. 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 So, so it's like the, the, the question is, is like, how do you engage somebody from the beginning versus getting that? Oh, you know what? Like I was wrong back then. I appreciate it now. Like, how can you shortcut that kind of like lifetime of realization and just get it like right off, you know, you know, right off the, the rip as the kids like to say nowadays, um, you know, and for me, like one of the things that I've been really fascinated by with this algebra thing again, and my attempt was to create a kind of a Harry Potter style game where you have this barrier in the middle and you have a wand and you move items from the left to the right, from the right to the left, because that's all algebra really is, is how the value changes once you change it across the equal sign. And we had some really good demos but then I was like, damn it, this game is more complicated than learning the algebra itself. You yeah. know, so, so so it's like, you know, it's a tricky one. I think that that's why it's a bit of a holy grail that you guys are, are, are trying to achieve. Well, you know, I kind of have a little bit of a different approach or thought. Mm. Yeah, I'd love that. Why? Why do we focus on teaching high school kids Shakespeare that they don't enjoy? Mm. Could that be a dessert that we serve later on in life? I mean, I think there's some things that I want to accomplish when I'm 30. I don't want to have it all front loaded necessarily. Right, right. I think no one. Is, is excellent because we turn kids off it when we try to force feed them something too early. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and like this all became like, because like I said, I've actually been pretty involved in this whole thing. I've done projects at the Field Museum of Natural History. 
around interactive education and stuff like this. Isn't there like some kind of Rockefeller standard educational unit or something that's been around forever and it's still what they use pretty much to this day? And it has this kind of curriculum that's almost like these Ten Commandments of education that people rarely kind of stray from, right? It's like it pretty much has to follow these little things and it hasn't really changed in 50 years, right? Am I right or wrong in that? You are right. <laughs> and like, what do you think that, why hasn't there been that level of, of kind of revisiting that old school system of education? Well, you know, there are a lot of really good examples out there. Um, I like to quote, the the Finney, the school system in Finland. Mm. But, you know, if you were to, I mean, when you look at ratings of countries and academic proficiencies, Finland is always right at the top. Mm. They do things very differently. Why don't we emulate them? You know how so? I, I, I'm not familiar. With their approach they have two or three things first of all they have a voucher system so that the private sector and the public sector compete vigorously and the public sector says the private sector keeps us on our toes and makes us have to compete for efficacy because if the if the, there's a school they have to publish their outcomes you know so the product they're creating is there for everybody to see. So, so if a school is underperforming, they lose, they lose students. You know, bad deal for them. So, yeah. it's competition is a good thing. Second thing they do is they allow kids to deep dive on things that they're interested in. Uh. The whole idea of a rounded education where you take political science and journalism and, and things when in fact you're a math whiz. You can, mm. you can do 80% of your time on math and physics, the stuff that you want. So um, I think a lot of these things always come down to the definition of judgment calls. What is the good? What makes a good student, a good citizen? Is it a rounded citizen better off? Or is a highly effective mathematician better for the nation? Mm. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, but that's I think fascinating. those are the right debates to have. You know, just hearing you talk, I don't even know. I've never had this thought before, and I'm actually kind of surprised I haven't. But um, you can teach a little kid a child of, uh, I, you know, probably five years old, how to play chess. And chess is an incredibly complicated game of mathematics, of geometry, of, of creativity, of spatial reasoning, of rules that can apply to the sort of English language and whatever. And you can teach a kid how to play chess. And sometimes you find these eight, nine-year-olds that will take you and demolish you without even like you knowing what happened. You know, I've been playing chess my entire life. Sometimes I'll play like a young child and my, you know, my, my dad always used to beat my butt until I was able to beat his. So whenever I play somebody young, I always try my hardest to, to beat them, like to shock them right all the way to the highest dial uh, because that tends to teach. Um, is there some kind of weird connection between chess and all this stuff? Is chess maybe the thing that we've been looking for this whole time? Like, what is it about chess that little kids tend to learn, even though it's so friggin' complicated? Gameplay in general, I think is instructive. Like my uh, six-year-old grandson last week <laughs> beat me in a game of Stratego. Oh, God, um, Stratego. I mean, like, that's a really difficult... Uh, oh, oh, Stratego, yeah. I thought you said Go. 
For a second there, I thought you were going to go go with the with the uh, name Atari itself coming from Go. I'm sorry. Stratego is also a very beautiful game. It's a beautiful game. And I thought that I was the master of <laughs> right, Stratego. Right. And he whooped me. <laughs> now, I'll admit that he had a really bizarre strategy that I was totally unaware of. <laughs> like, I would have never... I always put my minds back around my, my, you know, important guys. He put them right up front and just demolished me right off. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, this is all part of like what we, we talk about in the book uh, regarding like, if you have a child who's interested in something, mm. you can teach them all kinds of things around their interest. And, you know, a quick example, these two young brothers, the Lee brothers, the youngest pair that have ever been invited to speak at Pomacon, they mm. built life-size cardboard superheroes. Mm. And the first one they built fell apart after a few months. So they needed to figure out how they could build it so that they could take it apart to travel and mm. it would stand up. So they needed a skeleton. They taught themselves physics as sure. 13 and 15-year-olds because they had a problem they needed to solve. And that's, you know, both in the game and what we're talking about in the book. If you have, if you know what the child's interest is, and we should, then it's easy in, with current technology to have individualized learning in a classroom. AI makes it very easy on the teacher. You can create an, a test for it in 30 seconds. And, and as they get older, if you, if you're afraid they're writing their papers with AI and not doing it themselves. Yeah. Half, half the questions might be wrong in that, in that AI test, but you know. Well, uh, but the teacher just has to review and make sure. sure, sure. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Even if they're writing their papers with AI and they come to class, instead of having them handed in and the teacher spends the weekend grading papers, you have them present it, you do a Q&A, and you know right away whether they had an AI do it and they didn't learn. But if they had AI do it and they learned the material, why would we care that mm -hmm. AI helped them with their writing? Sure. I I agree with that. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm even more... I'm even more passe than that if they learned how to use ai to do the paper good on them right. <laughs> absolutely right. absolutely the problem the problem with 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 ai and look at ai is constantly evolving is that depending on what because like i think the most important thing that science teaches you is that no reality is 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 forever um, the same, right? Like variables constantly create potential changes in what you perceive to be factual or true or whatever. And AI, depending on what language or, or what, what data set it's trained on, might be 24 months behind. And AI loves to make stuff up too. So it's like, I got people that tell me, oh, yeah, just ask GPT. And like they take all of it as true. And like there's three things that I'm like, yeah, those three things are completely wrong. Like seven of them are right, but three of them are completely made up. Yeah. And like, you know, you're just kind of taking it as true. Yeah. And, and like there, there's some danger with that because there is no kind of quality assurance around it. Look, it's going to get better and it'll pretty, pretty soon will be perfect i guess but you know ai is a very powerful uh thing and um you know especially for for i think um i have an ai in my game that you you have to kind of interrogate and the one of the most amazing things that happens when you're speaking because you're speaking to them with your normal voice is how people freeze up around it like they almost get intimidated by it. Like when it's actually there for you to interact with, people are like, okay, what, what's going on? Like they, they almost get equally shy with an AI as they do with other people. And I'm not even sure where I'm going there, but uh, you know, all these things are kind of, you know, TBD. But my, my last question on this is big picture. You support AI in the classrooms. I absolutely yeah. do. I think they're going to have it for the rest of their lives, and it's up to us to teach them how to use it and how to be ethical with it. Mm. You know, and, and, and I want to say, hey, welcome to life. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. right. 
you know, AI making stuff up isn't unique in the universe. Students right. do it all the time. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. But at least a calculator, like if you press two plus two, 3,000 times, you would usually get, probably get four all 3,000 times where you ask AI one question 3,000 times, you're probably going to get 2,500 different responses. So, so it's like, but my AI said this, but your AI said that. And it's just, it becomes a little too subjective for me. Uh, but that's more of a critique of the current state of AI, I think, more than what the technology can potentially become in the future. But anyway, well, I'm starting to ramble. Comparing AI to a computer database versus comparing AI to a human, I think the I think the AI beats the human every time. Oh, without a doubt. Oh, without a doubt. Oh, God. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, you know, it, 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 it's unbelievable. It's, the, I've noticed my grandkids, they use Amazon Echo. I would say the A word, but all of a sudden my world would come alive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and also, um, the... People have been telling me about it. I kind of graduated over to uh, Google Docs about six, seven years ago. And I, I pretty much do all my stuff on Google now, like slides, docs, sheets or whatever. But me now too. that o OpenAI is integrated back in back, like deep into Microsoft called Microsoft Copilot, now they have the latest version of OpenAI integrated into the Microsoft suite of products. Everybody's telling me, yo, you gotta you gotta go back. It, it's it's amazing how good it's integrated. Where oh, with Google I, I I I I you're the second person that's mentioned that. Yeah I'm gonna do I'm gonna go I'll explore that. That that's going to be uh, interesting. Like I haven't done it yet. I'll be honest, I haven't done it yet. But one of my very close friends who knows that my game is probably the most, you know, not to show off, but it probably is the most advanced form of AI integration into an interactive product that I've ever seen. Maybe there's stuff out there that I'm just not aware of, but I- Where, where, um, where, where can I get your game? Yeah, the we game is to be our headsets. We'd like- Oh, to okay, yeah, the game is completely free. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, perfect. You got you have the perfect headset for it. I have so my game is completely free. Um, the Quest version is currently under closed beta, so I would just have to send you an invite. And then I'd okay. love to kind of walk you through it. Uh, the PC VR version is open to the public, but the Quest version, the standalone version, is in closed beta. But I, I'd love to show you guys it um, just so you can see how AI is integrating into a social context. Because I think the one interesting thing about AI is that everybody experiences AI one-to-one -one. Right. So it's like you give a kid an assignment for, you know, you know, like as an example, he's going to use AI to try to write his paper with him. In my game, the only real context you use AI in is in, is in a social setting. So, you know, you can create art, but people like start to sort of riff off each other like, oh, make this. And then, oh, no, you should try that. And like it's a very strange experience when you combine huh. AI with social. You know, it, it's kind of hard to describe because I can't think of any other examples. Um, but um, I'd love, I'd be honored, to, you know, to uh, to show you guys um, the game um, and completely free. So you don't have to worry about that. You just got to put it into your headset and then we can walk around and, and I can show you some stuff. Awesome. Cool. Well, you know, I'm, I'm actually not opposed to buying stuff. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, for us, look, I've been very lucky in my career. And for me, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to crack that nut of how I truly create a role playing game that is completely built on user generated content. So it has that kind of Neil Stevenson, uh, you know, dream of what, what, you know, what does the metaverse really look like? Before this whole, you know, you know, before it became a buzzword, it's right. like, you know, how do you create a social virtual setting that actually does have skill and people are better than others because of the amount of time 
that they invest into it, et cetera. Um, right. And I think it would be an honor for me to show Nolan his arcade machine in my office in the game. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's like, you know, <laughs> it's uh, that, I got that was, I got to do a little bit of brag. I had dinner with Neil Stevenson about a month ago. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. That's my hero. That's my yeah. hero. Uh, that's me my literary too. hero. Yeah, yeah. He, he's okay. He's, have you which which one do you like the best now? The, the, the so for me, now, for or, me, or, my favorite uh, Snow Crash is still my top one. Um, hmm. You know, um, Cryptonomicon I think is a very very special book because of the way I feel um, about Sir Isaac Newton and how it kind of incorporates all of that. Hmm you know, and the idea of cryptology and all that stuff. I also am fascinated by the Diamond Age. Oh, the Diamond, yeah, diamond Age. age for, the diamond next. Age for me, I think, is the number one. Oh, okay, um, yeah. yeah. For me, it's Snow Crash. You know, my entire game is kind of based around 70, it. 70s is my number two, actually. You know, I haven't read that one yet. I haven't read that one yet. That's oh, the one about the moon. That, that's yeah. the one about the moon. Yeah, yeah. I haven't read that one yet. What's it called, Nolan? Um, the Seven uh, Eves. The Seven Eves. Yeah. And and the other one that I'm just that I I just finished is Dodge in Hell. I, I've never read that one either. Mm -hmm. Dodge in Hell. Quick synopsis. Yeah. Rich guy. Basically, donate some money to a company that is trying to take your consciousness. Oh, and yeah, have I have heard of in, in the computer. Right, right. And he forgets about it, but dies. And they take his brain and scan it and put it into a computer. Now he's alive, but living in a virtual environment. Right. Fascinating. And he's not sure he likes it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is something I'll show you uh, guys when 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 it's you go into of, my game. But I, uh, I love it to death. <laughs> I, I've done something similar with uh, Salvador Dali. Mm -hmm. I um, I created a, a fully we call them cognitive NPCs. I created a cognitive NPC that's based on Salvador Dali specifically. He knows everything there is to know about his life. But the scary part is, is that through old recordings, we created a synthetic version of his voice. And when you hear it, oh, there's yeah. something, there's something quite haunting about it. And then when you go to the to the paintings, any like anything you say gets uh, put into a model that's only trained on Salvador Dali art. So it always looks like Salvador Dali. Um, so anyway, there's some fascinating stuff in there. I'd, I'd love to show you, but I also want to be respectful of your time. We're about to hit an hour here. This has been so much fun. Um, there's, there, there's a well, website. We can, for we can be really wide ranging when you get here. Cause you know, taking, you know, taking wild brains and going off onto <laughs> rogue <laughs> adventures. That, that's, that's, that's life at its best. Yeah. Oh, amen. Um, so Exodexa, the website. Currently on the website, as far as I understand, and please tell me if I'm wrong, um, is just an ability to order the book. There's no way to learn more about the product. Uh, there's there's basically just the book. Well, you can join the Founders Circle, and every month with the Founders Circle, we do office hours. We just did the first one this morning. Oh, that sounds fun. Yeah, and we'll start revealing it to that inner circle of people, and they really are our beta group. They're going to give us the feedback on the game, so it it will be possible a month at a time is there a discord for it since it's a gaming product i gotta tell you for me and my product the discord community has been so helpful to like you know that's build a good that idea up. we haven't been yet but we should yeah yeah I, agree. yeah I think that that could actually be and it takes time to establish you know like a community it doesn't happen overnight but it's it's your most engaged audience and it's your audience that's willing to have the most feedback, right. you know, yeah. and that's a very important thing when you're creating something is feedback. And, you know, then you have to figure out whether you take it or you don't take it. But, 
you know, the fact that it's there and that people are willing to give it is always a good sign. Yeah. Yes. Thank you for that idea. Oh, thank you guys for your time so much. Um, I'm going to follow up on, um, on email and, um, so that we can try to get you guys into the game. If you're interested in checking it out. I'd love I, to. I'm very interested in that. And, cool. uh, it sounds like there's kind of an educational component. Maybe it can be part of our platform. Oh, it's extremely educational. I like, like I said, this has been a fascination of mine for a very, very long time. Um, mm -hmm. It's a tough nut to crack. So oh, yeah. you know, you don't, you don't go in there and learn math, but there's nothing that you can do in my game that you can't do with other people. So I feel that that forcing mechanism of being social is also a very important lesson. You know, to me, like my biggest critique of homeschooling is, well, how do you socialize the kids? Like yeah. without, you know, without that element of it, there is no sense of competitive advantage or, you know, that kind of competitive marketplace, if you will, to make ideas bigger and better. Um, and I think that, that currently, that's where a lot of the focus is of my platform. But the thing about my platform, it's that it's meant to um, allow you to publish anything, right? So kind of like Roblox or Minecraft or, you know, VR chat is the big one in my space. It's that here's an SDK that allows you to publish your own content, you know, right. and like, and it should be able to support any kind of content, I think, including specifically educational one. Last thing I'll mention about it is I'm obsessed with like ancient Egypt and all that stuff. And I've never been there, but I had my uh, one of my uh, my artists build me a exact geographical replica of the Great Pyramids of Giza location with the Sphinx, the three pyramids, the valley, like the mountains. And it's about three kilometers squared that we currently have in the game. And it's a one for one of what it actually is like in real life. So it oh, takes wow. you the same... It takes you the same amount of distance to walk from one spot to the other, but in glorious Unreal Engine graphics and like the sun beating on your face. And, and, and like you start to relate to these places differently, you know? Um, um, anyway, I can talk about that stuff all day, but, you know, again. I, mean, I, I, I want to go to Petra in VR. Oh, that's the beautiful thing about VR is that VR gives you memories it, it like it doesn't yeah. give you experiences it gives you memories yeah and, right. and, and that's a very different thing than a flat screen like a flat screen a book yeah. a movie it, you know it gives you like you know ideas and stuff and it's fun but when you remember vr it's like when you remember a memory it, 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 it's very it's very weird that way there's something so, about have we have we done the red pill or the blue pill Right. <laughs> right. Right. Look, I, I have a red pill addiction, you know, when it comes to just always trying to find out what's on the other side. So, right. you know, I, I'm not the right person to ask about that, you know, uh, but um, awesome. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you all for listening. The book is Exodexa from the great uh, Nolan Bushnell and Dr. Leah. Haynes, and I will see you guys no, all. No, no, no. It, oh. it's, the book is shaping the future of education. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Exodex is the education. And I might mention if you if you if you basically buy five or six of them on Amazon, they're good for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, Nolan. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Mark. <laughs>